Hello, and welcome to the About Manchester podcast. Sometimes it is said that if you start a business in the middle of a recession, then the only way is surely up. Well, a new business has just done that, and even more so in the middle of a pandemic, which sees its sector plunge into lockdown. A new Salford-based premium drinks company called Ten Locks launched in the summer. Under the stewardship of Becky Davis, it focuses on spirits and aims to curate, create and craft a portfolio of premium drink brands. In their own words, they bring new tastes, fresh perspectives and a true sense of excitement to the UK drinks industry. Okay, we're underway. So, Becky, I suppose the first question I've got to ask is, um, what's it like to start up an enterprise in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Every time people ask me that, I laugh. <laughs> it's just unheard of, isn't it? Uh-huh. I think I'm either bonkers or genius, but we haven't quite decided which of the two. <laughs> um, it's been a challenge, for sure. Um, but I'm one of them people whose cups always... Well, I'm really, really positive and I'm just trying still now. I mean, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but all the way through lockdown, just trying to keep as positive as possible and, and try and encourage everybody else around me to be positive too. But it, we've had our moments, we've had our ups and downs for sure. It's been really, really difficult. I think I wrote about 15 different business plans, ripped them off <laughs> again. Um, our strategy changed, our customers, God bless the on trade. Um, we just didn't know what to do because that was our whole plan to work with the on trade. And then all of a sudden I'm selling to grocery. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great and we've already had some successes. So. Okay. What, 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 what have been the pluses of doing it in lockdown? I mean, what, I tell you, one, one of the things I've found is it's a lot easier to get hold of people. Absolutely. No one's ever late, are they? No. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not, they don't have to travel anywhere. So I think one of the main pluses for me is the time that, so we were originally going to launch in June. Um, and I honestly think if we'd have done that, bear in mind, we launched in October and our website's still not ready. So <laughs> I think if we had a launched in June, it would have been too soon. And I've really had time to labor over my decisions and really think about what's right for the business and what where the market's going to go and do a full risk assessment and then rip it up and start again (laughs) (laughs) so yeah and i think another one is um the productivity um you're not driving here or there i'm straight on my laptop at eight in the morning and i have my lunches breakfast and sometimes dinner here (laughs) (laughs) i know i know the feeling (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you get a lot done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of distractions as well. Like like I had the cricket on this morning while I was doing some work. So <laughs> on another screen. <laughs> my only distraction is my dog, who tends to snore when I'm presenting. Really loud. He's a French bulldog. Oh, the postman. That's it. When the window cleaner likes to knock on my window, and you can tell them clearly on a video call. <laughs> So what, um, you know, I've got to, I mean, how's it going in terms of, I mean, obviously you've said you've ripped up 15 different business plans. Where are you compared to where you wanted to be six months ago? Um, behind, for sure. Okay. Um, but then, do you know what? We've kind of phased in the recruitment. So initially we were going to have three resources from the get-go, recruit more people in January, um, and I think we've just kind of played it by ear. We've not had any knee-jerk reactions. We've just kind of looked at the market and been like, ugh. So initially I was going to have someone in London. I've got two people in Manchester and I was going to recruit a sales manager for London. And I thought, you know what? Let's just hold off. Let's wait to see what the on-trade does. Let's not rush because the off-trade might not want our products. It might be too premium. So it was all kind of up in the air. So being, being quite, quite calculated and finding out, getting feedback as much as possible, um on the brands and then making decisions based on demand um so now we're, we're in a good position because instead of spending all this money on resource and not getting the volume we've, we've we're phasing it in and now that we're starting to get volume and also learning the whole online i've never really paid attention to e-commerce before and now i'm talking about it probably at least every <laughs> other meeting so what 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 proportion before before this when this was all planned before the pandemic started what proportion of online were you looking at uh, how how big a role was that going to play in the original plan? Um, so it was always 
there. I think like every business. Mm -hmm. um, and in my previous role, it was always there. It was always important. And we could see that it was growing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, no one anticipated what was going to happen. I, I had a meeting with Amazon uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they said that their spirit sales are up 200%. Um, and oh. it, it's been crazy. So learning all of that has been really beneficial. But was it was it part of the plan, a big part of the plan at the beginning? Not really. It was in there. It was in all the forecasts, but it was minimal um, because I actually didn't understand enough of it. I didn't know what sort of volumes, and you don't really until you put the products on there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was. It wasn't a focus, put it that way. But since lockdown, it's been a real. It's been at the forefront of everything we do. Okay, and you said you learnt a lot about the online from not knowing a great deal. What? Is it? Oh, it's obviously you, it's going to play a bigger part going forward. Whatever happens, yeah, for sure. I think um, working with the right partners as well. Um, we've, it's funny because there's some buyers who are now looking after uh, online retail who I've worked with in the past, which is always lovely. You, you don't really have a face until you meet them uh, for these online retailers. Um, so that's been quite nice working with those again. Um, but we've also kind of we've been quite quite creative. We're a startup, so we've created our own D2C offering, um, which isn't launched yet. It will be done before Christmas along with our website, thank God. Um, <laughs> but we will be able to sell direct to consumer via our own website. Um, and we've kind of created this weird hybrid model. We're not actually doing the logistics ourselves, but we're doing it with a third party. And it's just a really good way to get our product straight to the consumer. Okay. If, God forbid, there's another national lockdown. Perhaps you could just tell us a little bit, bit about the business and the idea behind it and why you decided to start up and also maybe a little bit about but your background as well. Yeah, for sure. So um, I joined Kings and we started having conversations last year about November time, I think it was, and they wanted to delve into spirit. And I was happy at my current employer at the time, but I also am quite ambitious and I saw the opportunity and I loved the people behind Kingsland and what they wanted to do and their values and beliefs. And there was, a, there was an alignment there mm -hmm. uh, of minds meeting. Um, so I agreed to join them um, and then worked my notice and started officially in March, uh, the two weeks before lockdown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Just about remember that. <laughs> yeah. So all the planning uh, that we'd done up until that point, and there was quite a bit going on um, behind the scenes. Um, kind of changed when lockdown happened. We kind of froze a little bit, like grab it in the headlights, and then decided, right, well, we're going to have to change this plan. Let's write a few business plans, so on and so forth. Um, and and a little bit about Ten Locks as a business. We are a portfolio of premium drinks brands, and at the moment we're just focusing on spirits, but we will delve, delve into other categories in the future. And all of our brands strive for positive change in one way or another. So whether that be with regards to sustainability or uh, ethical practices or social responsibility or being helping the local economy, these are all positive things that we stand and champion. Um, so all of our brands have these wonderful attributes, um, which that isn't the only thing. They've got to be good. So uh, the key things also is liquid first. Um, they've got to have standout packaging. I've had a few comments recently, some feedback that we've got a very good looking portfolio, which um, I'm, I'm happy about. Um, and then another thing which I think is really, really important right now is commercial viability. Uh, we're about to go into a recession um, and people keep saying you're crazy going into premium spirits in a recession. But I think there's definitely um, there's been a, a, a segmentation of the population and there's people that are really really struggling and they've been on furlough and they've only getting 80 percent of the wage and then there's people who have not been able to spend money and they've been able to save mm -hmm. and it's awful really that should this you shouldn't be getting wider that gap um, but i think that's what's happening through this pandemic and um, our consumers are certainly the ones that would trade up and try these premium products but also want products that are positive and authentic and credible um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do Okay. Do you think, just, just looking ahead, do you think there's, you've, you've touched on it then, but do you think there's, there's going to be more of a sort of a seismic shift in the way people sort of consume, not just necessarily premium spirits, but alcohol, food, drink in general? Yeah, for sure. I think um, drinking at home is 
not going anywhere. I think people are getting creative. Um, and because of that, I think they're also trying to get hold of the jaws more so that they can make cocktails at home. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. everyone during lockdown tried to master the espresso martini. Um, <laughs> done it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you try? We've done it. <laughs> in fact, we used, to, we used to make them at our Christmas thing, so we're very good at it. <laughs> oh, and how were they? Were yeah, good. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think that, that that will continue, and I think also at home experiences will continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pray, try to be quite creative and bringing the bartender to to consumers' homes and making a bit of a, an event of it. I think there's been so much DIY going on that everybody wants to show off their new houses. <laughs> <laughs> so that's certainly going to continue. And then with regards to drinks categories and consumers, I think there will be a call for brands that are doing right in in one way or another sustainability is huge we're all talking about it we all need to make a difference Um, and it's just putting one step in front of the other it's small changes for big big change small steps for big change um so i think that'll be quite key but also i think there's been a huge boom in the rtd market and i've Mm -hmm. tried a lot and i have to say I think consumers are going to push back a little bit and ask for more flavour, ask for a bit of substance. Um, so we we are backing not only these wonderful products that we can talk about, but they taste delicious. So that's key, right? We're consuming them. We're, we're eating and drinking. So um, hopefully everyone will really enjoy the flavour of all of our products as well. Okay. Um, what about just staying on that subject? What about the... The market and, and sort of do you think people are going to go back into into pubs and restaurants in the same numbers that they left yeah. in 12 months ago i actually had a conversation about this yesterday um i think long live the pub i think people will have more and more appreciation for the pub um i think lockdown really showed how much we love the pub mm-hmm. <laughs> um mm-hmm. but also i think um another key oh, my partner's waving at me <laughs> Um, I think also what will happen and what's really really sad because all all my friends and some of my family are in the industry and the entrees there are going to be businesses going out of business and but what and I really, really feel for them people. But what will happen is the quality. When some, another business goes in and replaces the businesses that do go under, mm-hmm. the quality will get higher and the standard will get higher. I think the industry was getting to a point where, I mean, premiumization was getting to the extreme. People mm-hmm. were paying 40, 40, 50 pounds for a bottle of vodka or a gin. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that if you can make a product in a day, I think you've got to draw the line somewhere. Um, and then also within the industry, there was such a boom in the trade that I think people were getting promoted before they really should have been at that stage with regards to making decisions and buying and the commercial viability of bringing these brands on board and what that meant for margin and cash mm-hmm. margin or percentage margin. And I was talking about this yesterday. Um, and I think everyone's going to be a lot smarter um, in, in the coming year with regards to the recession and making decisions based on this is why I think there's a future for premium because mm-hmm. it's not about the percent, the margin percentage. It's about the cash margin that will be made. And so I think the quality there won't be as many, and it won't be as booming as it was. But I think the quality will get better, um, and the service okay. people will also demand more because they're they're competing with home, right? They want a better product because otherwise they'll just stay at home and cook themselves. When you, just going back to something you said in that, you said about people being over promoted. What what what, do you, what did you mean by that? Not not so much over promoted, but more I think because there was such a demand for staff yeah. in the on food. I think just we just couldn't get the caliber at one point to keep up with the demand of all the places opening. Okay, and, but it, it wasn't even the caliber as such. It was more there wasn't enough training happening. The demand for all these new openings were happening. That people weren't getting trained. To the levels that they should have been because it was just happening too quickly so now it's slowed down a bit i think mm-hmm. there'll be a big focus on training service and all the key things that the hospitality do so well yeah yeah do you think that's just in your industry or do you think that's a general is that a general comment about industry uk wide just interested yeah maybe industry wide yeah i think I th- and we all knew that at some point a recession was going to come. I just think we didn't know that it was going to be a global pandemic that would do it. 
Okay. Um, do you are you are you just UK sales or are you looking? Are, are you branching out overseas? I'm going to mention the I am going to mention the B word in a minute, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, um, at the moment, we're just it's national, UK yeah, wide, yeah. Um, but we will eventually be creating some of our own brands, um, right? And, and uh, we will export them at that point. Okay, okay. And what's your feeling on what's going on at the moment in terms um, of trade? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll ride that wave and see what happens. I think. Um, I try not to get too bogged down with it, to be honest. I think it's um, turbulent, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to be reactive and you just have to be positive. We've got to make a good situation out of it. So okay. that's what we do as business people, right? We, we the, the cup is always half full. It is, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. What about you? What drives you? Um, do you know what? Someone asked me this recently. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a people pleaser. Okay. Um, like pleasing people um but i also really like people in general i like working with people mm -hmm. i like i like like-minded people but i also like listening to people who have a different point of view i think that's so important and i don't think we do that enough anymore um i like trying to understand why people act certain ways and <laughs> just, I just really like people, and I think that's what drives me i think this industry i come from the hospitality industry and it's all about looking after people and getting to know people and being that you know personable and that's what I'm about and that's what drives me and now having all these wonderful brand owners that you feel passionate about their brand but actually them as people they work so hard and it's mm -hmm. a labor of love creating these products so mm -hmm. being able to do right by them and influence in that way is really really great but then also having a team that you love working with and and Kingsland is a wider business as on mothership company, I call it. Mm -hmm. um, learning, I've made some incredible relationships there um, and I'm learning every day. And I think that sharing of knowledge is just so powerful. Okay. How do you select the people to, to work with on, on, on your own team, in your own team? What do you so look I, for when somebody comes to an interview? What do you look for? <laughs> I would never hire anybody that I wouldn't want to go for a beer with. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, for what we do and what we're about, passion is so key. Um, mm -hmm. I I need people who lose that passion and who have that um, thirst for knowledge, I think. Um, and and I, I really like, in my previous job, I would recruit people from the on trade um, that were ready for that next step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's also very, very important to have a diverse team because if you're all thinking the same and no one challenges you um but it's nice to have that a similar background where you can bounce off and just know that you're not going insane when you're trying to get something over the line um but i think that the, i've got two recruits on at the moment and they both have a demonstrated history in sales and the on trade okay. um so they understand hospitality they understand sales Sinead, who's our brand development manager she um she's incredible at community Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'll, say I'll go off on a tangent, and I think everybody understands it, but they don't. And she's just really good at understanding how to get that across, and that's that's what marketing is, right? Okay, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And um, what are the ambitions for the for the company? For Ten Locks, but where? But I know this is a horrible question, but where where do you see it in three years, five years, and yourself, for that matter? I mean, I'm one of those people that you should always have a goal in sight. Yeah. I'm, I'm sad in the sense that I write my goals every January for the year. Do you really, Wash? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, this, for, for ten lots, sometimes, especially this year in particular, has been so difficult just to kind of cut through the fog sometimes. you I've always had to have that idea in the forefront of my mind of where we're going to go. Um, I don't see us... I'm ambitious. I'm not saying we're going to be the next Diageo. I'm not saying we're going to be small. I think we have the capability to really grow and really make an impact. And mm -hmm. that's, that's something that really drives me. Mm -hmm. How big are we going to get and how quickly? I don't know. I think if, as long as we grow the brands in the right way with people that actually like love them, um, not like them, I want them to love the brands. I want them to really connect um, and then 
and it eventually will grow incrementally. I think that's the best way to do it and just see where we get to. Okay. And obviously you're dealing with spirits at the moment. Where, where, what other directions are you going to go in in terms of your brands? Or are you not? is that all secret? I can, I can touch on certain categories that we're looking yeah. into. Um, so the premium mixer category is really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened in the gin boom, um, everyone was trying all these different tonics and mixers. And then also, as, as good as making cocktails at home is, it's messy. You need loads of ingredients. It's quite difficult to do. You need loads of ice, you don't have, so on and so forth. So um, I think premium mixers are one to watch as a category. Uh, we're talking to a couple of options. Um, and the RTD market, but a good one, a, a really good quality, well-made, great ingredients RTD product would be great to do in the portfolio. Um, and then, who knows, maybe a brand new category that no one's ever tried before. Okay, okay. Um, okay, and just it's a question I probably should have gone before. Um, what lessons have you sort of learned about taking out the pandemic? Let's pretend that hasn't been there. What what have you what have you learned? What what have you done wrong? What do you feel you've done wrong? And what would you change if you go back six months or twelve months to when you were planning? Oh my That's a horrible question, isn't it? <laughs> it's a horrible question, but it's a, it's a good one. Um, I, I'll start with how much have I learned. I've never learned so much in mm-hmm. such a small space of time. I, mm-hmm. I remember waking up and my brain would be aching after processing everything I'd learned that day. Um, and Kingsland are incredible at what they do and I'm just absorbing all that knowledge. Um, what would I do differently? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think believing myself a bit more. Um, okay. It's, the, the business model of Ten Locks is the absolute opposite of Kingsland. And I I started this journey knowing what we needed to do and I lost my way a little bit in the middle um, because because and having to prove all the time that we're on the right track, this is what we should do, and this is a brand and this is a category and this is where it should be. It, it has felt challenging at times, um, but I think that's just growth, isn't it? That's just me growing into the role. Um, and actually, I've found now that, yes, we, we were right. We were on the right track. I wasn't just making it up. <laughs> so you work with you work with quite a lot of local brands. Can you tell us something about them and um, why you selected them? We've uh, amongst our portfolio from all over the world. We're bringing things in from Mexico, Australia, you name it. Um, we've also uh, honed in on two wonderful local brands, so Diablas Rum and Salford Rum. Um, we really believe, and Kings and his uh, sister company really, really believe in supporting local. Um, Salford Rum is backed by, uh, created by two uh, Salford lads, um, and the artwork on the bottle is actually created by a local artist. Okay, before. okay. Uh, it's got the Salford docks on. I've actually got it here, but obviously the podcast. Yeah. I've met him. He taught me how to do that, Dave Draws. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you tried yet? Sorry? No, my colleague has because he did some video for them, I think, but I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. So. <laughs> really well, they, they are doing a really good job. And right. They still go to all the markets, uh, local markets, to sell the product there. So you actually get to meet the two creators. Right. Okay. Um, and then we've also got Diablaz, which is um, a rum from uh, the Caribbean, and it's blended here in Manchester and bottled here in Manchester. Yeah, I've met, I've met her as well. <laughs> yeah. Of course she has. <laughs> yeah, she's um she's doing a great job. The liquids are incredible, and she's done the first ever clementine spiced rum. All oh, right. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, give us a give us a give us a cocktail that we can all make for Christmas. Um. So probably something really delicious. You know, when you wake up on. Christmas morning, mm-hmm. you can have a Bucks Fizz or a mimosa. So just add a little bit of clementine spice in there to your mimosa and it'll be delicious. Right, so okay. champagne, orange juice, clementine spice. Okay, I'll try that. That sounds really good. <laughs> good way to start the morning.